ecological conferences. Oh, yeah. Uh, obviously, we went to Berlin last year, and that was amazing. That was great fun. That was incredible. I have been looking around at other ecologically focused conferences, and there are some skill acquisition ones. There are some more academically inclined ones, but there are not many. No. There are not many. And when I look around at the research and the conversations through the ecological approach, there are lots of coaches talking about it. But there's not what I would say a a, a go-to, um, there is a go-to conference, but you have to go looking for it. <laughs> right, one, one, just a moment. There are coaches talking about it? Oh, uh, yeah, well... I football, assume, I assume football, we're talking sports basketball, coach. fencing, yeah, okay. like co coaches, like sport, say. sports coaches. <laughs> I should have been specific. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sports coaches are talking about it uh, in skill acquisition. Even though I don't like the term skill acquisition because I feel like it's it should be skill development. But yeah, we we can argue yeah. back. We can argue back and forth on that. So yeah, the, mm -hmm. the these conferences that sort of exist, there are some big limitations for me at least. And let me know if you agree. First. You have to fly to them most of the time because they're not in England. Yeah, we need to do... Yeah, yeah. So an English one would be nice. Yes, please. Second struggle is the conversation is extremely high level. Mm. You don't... You, you can't really... They're, they're academically driven conferences. You can't really go in unless you've consumed a dictionary. <laughs> Like if if you if you're not familiar with affordances, constraints, attractors, metastable attenuation, bifurcations, if those words scare you, the conference is going to go way over your head. Yeah. For for the first couple of talks, at least. Yeah. So I feel like we need a, a, a ecological psychology for beginners conference. But who would attend? The people that are interested that don't have the time to embed themselves within all of the, the research. I would say. I love embed themselves within the research yeah when, when i look at the the discord the ecological dynamics discord there are loads of coaches in there interested and talking about the constraints led approach but the constraints led approach isn't necessarily ecological psychology because saying oh there is a constraint here is different from saying we are using constraints to try and help people perceive affordances yeah it's different isn't it it's very much like an ecological approach isn't just constraints and affordances. Yeah. Differential learning design. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Just so many beautiful and sexy things that don't ever really get spoken about because it's always constraints. I suppose it's because there is very much... One of the things that I've been thinking about over the last kind of couple of weeks or week, a, a while now, is like designing a an offer that is using the ecological approach but doesn't require anyone to know the ecological approach <laughs> which is because because in my industry i'm not 100 percent sure i know that people want something different mm. they want change because they're tired of the same old same old ways of working and it just doesn't make sense and there's no it's just all been boiled down to in in at least in the business space do less do only mm. one thing. And yet there's a big wide group of people who are like, yeah, but I, if I could just do one thing, that wouldn't be the problem. <laughs> sure, great. I can just do one thing. Let's boil it down. To one. But when there isn't one thing going on, when there's a lot going on, you've got to think about something else. So they know that the approach that is mentioned everywhere doesn't make sense, but I don't know whether they entirely know why. I think it does make sense. But I think that it the doesn't match their. It, it makes sense, but it doesn't match their experience. It doesn't match what they are, how they experience life, how they experience their business. And it's like, oh, I just have to fix this problem, make it better, and what if there wasn't a problem and all that lovely stuff. So is it for them? I, I mean, when you look at the ecological approach, the instructional design that most business coaches use, the feedback is knowledge about. It's yeah. knowledge about the thing, not knowledge of the thing. So mm -hmm. enabled, if you want to use an ecological approach to what I would say is business coaching, for lack of a better yeah. term, you would need to look at practice design. So 
looking at their day of doing business, the actual practice of doing business, and then either adding constraints, removing constraints, eliciting affordances, developing expertise in certain skills during the practice. So having an hour long conversation about how your business went this week isn't useful if you're looking at it from an ecological perspective because you're mm. now talking about the thing it's now instructions it's not knowledge of it's knowledge about and yeah. the feedback isn't necessarily getting being... getting in there in the weeds isn't it it's getting right in there yeah uh, yeah yeah hence and, why and that's I... that's what your approach would be it's okay yeah. we're, we're going to practice business we're going to do the practice of business we're going to we're not going to talk about it we're going to yeah. do it yeah I think it's really exciting and and that is something that I've one of my clients who I've been really leaning into the ecological approach with without them really knowing I've spoken about it a little bit because they're actually an academic which says a lot and so we have been talking and I've just been using the approach and all of a sudden everything just clicked what for them um it was it was very similar to I think it was definitely very similar to my experience but all of a sudden everything just clicked why huh why ah uh, good question things just don't oh yeah now it works that's a good question i don't know because there's time stay time scales obviously of analysis uh, i guess this relates to what i was talking about uh with a couple of the couple of people in the eco d space we were talking about fractals Ooh. but yeah for people that aren't familiar with fractals the i think the best explanation or analogy used is the coastline of britain when you look at britain and you try and measure the coastline if you take a ruler of whatever length and you measure it you get one measure if you make the ruler smaller well now it's going to be a different measure and make the ruler smaller it's now a different measure all of them are accurate but at different scales and that's in yeah a... <laughs> yeah going back to what you were saying it's very much like it wasn't one thing that clicked. It was just a bunch of small little things, like little pieces of land, as you were talking about with, with you know, a wonderful country. <laughs> but like, and how it was just a load of little things that all happened in a diff completely ran what feels like a chaotic order. Oh, I wonder why. Um, and it just, there was a moment for me. It was Critical a vert state. A vertical state. <laughs> Critical <laughs> state. That's, that's the Critical terminology. Come on. All right, cool. All right, fine. There was a critical state <laughs> where basically it just was like, boom. Okay, cool. I The way I described this in the call, so we, we had a, a Teams call. Why we use Teams? Us. Um, but if you're listening, Daniel, apologies, but Teams is just, yeah. Um, so <laughs> we, we were on this Teams call, and the way I described this critical state was... I. I know you don't drive, but you probably experienced this being in a car. When there's a roundabout and everyone gets to the roundabout at the same time, it's kind of like a a, a wild west of who's who, who's gonna who's gonna go first, who's gonna move forwards first, because you're meant to give way to the right at a roundabout. But if you've approached at the same time, you all look at each other like, right, who's pulling, who's gonna what it and and then it will someone will make the move. Most of the time it's me because I can't be bothered to wait. If, if I slow down and the other person on the right is stopped, I'm like, right, I'm, I'm going then. Uh, but there is a, there is a, a moment where you you all look at each other and you're like, who's going to make the first move? And that to me is the critical state. And all of the different fluctuations that have happened before that, the fractaled, the, the, the fractaled, I don't know if that's a word it is now, um, state of dynamics of each of those cars. They're autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles, doing their own things, going all over the place. But it gets to this roundabout, this point, where we got to navigate, we got we got to do something to keep moving, and that state, that fractal, uh, that critical state, I think is the aha moment in learning. It's the oh, I get it now. That makes sense now, or I can do that now, or right, I I see what I need to be attending to, like education of attention or education of intention. The individual has self-organized all of the specifying information to a point at which they can execute whatever skill behavior it is with a different level of understanding whether that is yeah. deeper or more shallow it depends on the context but they have now found a state at which it, it is critical uh, and i think for me inside of learning environments practice design it's easier to get to those critical states through practice design than it is through yeah. instructional design that's from my experience yeah agree agree but talking about all of this, 
at a conference, a group, a group conversation, the group conversation I was in, there were four other coaches, all of which are very versed in the field and they could read an article a 20 page article about fractals fractal mathematics is extremely complex and all of the sports coaches could talk about it one's in fencing one's in tennis uh, a couple in football one's an academic doing phd and then myself is just this like orange guy talking about stuff uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but we we were all at the level at which we could communicate through this language the conferences are very similar from my experience and from the conversations I've had with others about the conferences. Uh, and obviously it costs to go to the conferences. So how do we spread this ecological approach, taking the ecological approach through physical events, through in-person events, if you're not a sporty person, so you're not going to go to the Skellac yeah. conferences and you're not an academic, so you're not going to go to the, hey, here's some complicated physics and maths and thermodynamic yeah. shit. Like yeah you how do we get you to one of those conferences before yeah. you had a me that's a good question that is a really good question how would i i mean even listening to the podcast episodes talking about it if you go to a podcast episode talking about ecological dynamics yeah. nine times well 99 10 99 times out of 100 it's going to be about sport either yeah. mma baseball basketball football tennis cricket golf rugby like all, all of all of the sporty things i which... mean that's kind of what we have here like my intention is you're the one with all the complicated words and i'm trying to translate them and probably end up using them too <laughs> in the end if, if we're going to communicate we need to be able to communicate mm. using similar terminology otherwise we'll be speaking past each other yeah that's true but, but I how do we... we how do we introduce that so what we, what we I... have i feel is is trying to do that because i from my experience, at least, I would say I'm not necessarily translating, I guess, interpreting. Interpreting my... is more accurate. Yeah, no, interpretation is more... Because it... Yeah. I, I'm Even though I'm using the words, certainly more than you do sometimes. Yeah. It's, it's not a, hey, here's a sentence of lots of jargon and you have to follow everything I say. I try and then expand or go into... Depth. And translate it into a practical example. Inter what I think is exactly what is needed for a conference that is designed for people who are not those other people <laughs> familiar with the jargon yeah who for those who are not familiar with jargon and one of the things that i found even doing berlin was it was i think we both said it was very theoretical it was very theory based and not really practical based action based action orientated mm. yeah well, yeah it, it wasn't very actionable which people often like especially when they yes. go to conferences like what's the point <laughs> yeah exactly it's like oh this is great i love talking about these geeky nerdy things that we we spoke about with the snap the crackle and the pop but how does it make uh, a difference yeah how does it but make what a do difference? i do about it what do i do yeah and i think i think this podcast is part of it mm. the, maybe we need to do a conference i'm glad you said that because that's what i was thinking <laughs> what maybe we need to do an ecological taking conference. an ecological approach as and it's, it's interesting you say that. What I, what I would love to do is bring individual, obviously we've spoken with uh, Scott and I've spoken with some other coaches. It would be great to speak to the coaches, the sports coaches, and seeing how they apply ecological dynamics yeah, outside like, like of the sport. Real, real like tasty, juicy stuff. Because that's the bit I find most interesting. It's like, so how are you applying it here? Mm. Like, I think going back to our... Um, pop episodes the philosophy of practice like those whole of you going deep into how you do what you do and why you do them and all of that was probably the most fascinating experience that i had well, it's and then as we kind of and then each time we go into this experience of like talking about this and then about that and then about this and then the exact like it was really interesting. To, I just like knowing how people do things because everyone, especially in the business world, there's a lot of talk about what you should do versus Knowledge about. what you actually do. Knowledge of. Precisely. And that is the interesting thing. And it would be so cool to have. And, and I, most people in business think they don't know. I, so it's funny you say that. I've been speaking with some of the uh, 
I don't want to say professional athletes because they're not professional, they're trampolinists, but some high level athletes in trampoline and asking them to articulate how they're learning the skills, like the, the bigger skills, the more complex skills that many people don't even dream of doing. They, they've struggled to articulate it and they're using typical language. Oh, the, the coach just told me to do it. I just, it was natural talent or I just, yeah, but that's that's what the coaches say because the coaches don't know how to explain it. So mm -hmm. they're saying, "Oh, they were just naturally talented," or I asked them to do something, they just did it. And you're like, "Yeah, but there, there must be reasons why." Uh, and a lot of the other explanations go into they use words that they know to explain the experiences, but it I don't think it's accurate. So they say, "Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just focusing. I can see where I'm at." What do you mean you can see where you're at? When you're doing three full twists and two front somersaults, and the, you can't see anything. It's just a blur. But they can see it. Where they see it, I think, is the interesting question here. Because mm. I'm still midway through a conversation, which it's, it's hard to have the conversation because obviously I know where I think we're going to go, but I don't want to lead the person there. So I'm asking them open questions to see what they answer, um, which is a fun experience in itself. Mm. But they are saying that they see the moves but they're not visually seeing the moves i don't think they are uh, and what they said is they feel the moves afterwards they're like oh yeah i just i just feel where i am i'm like ah so feeling and seeing are different like they are actual different things they're different senses you have haptics and then you have vision so when they say oh yeah i i can see the skill i see where i am in the skill i think it's their perceptual system the body as an embodied embedded organism can see it and C being a, a, an alternative or a synonym, a replacement, because they don't have the, uh, the ecological terminology, they are perceiving the skill. Yeah. They yeah. are perceiving the skill, not seeing the skill. And that, to me, is a practical example of how trampolinists, gymnasts, acrobatics, when they're using traditional cognitivistic approaches, they're saying, oh, yeah, I can see the skill. I need to spot the end deck. Or I need to spot the trampoline. I need to spot the floor. Yeah, but are you actually seeing the floor when you're doing Millers and Rudy's, Randy's, Shrifts? Like, no. Uh, yeah, spinny, flippy shit. Cool, thank you. Um, <laughs> it kind of, it, it's in business, it's often spoken about intuition mm. and gut. It's kind of, it, I, I'm, I'm kind of hearing the same. It's like, oh yeah, because I sent an email talking about this a little bit. And the reply was, yeah, I call this my intuition. And I'm like, what's your perceptive system? I like... I like the word perceptive system. It's nice. Perceptive system. It feels good. Oh. And, and, it, and, it, and it's very much... And I, <laughs> yeah, I realised I wrote that a while back and... You're remembering. I am. Yeah, I'm remembering. Let me, you, hang on you, a minute. You plucked it out of your stories, though, didn't you? Hang on. <laughs> cool. Just put the memory <laughs> stick back in again, you know, defrag, um, whatever. You got to re you got to re-encode that. Mm, yes. Yeah, let me re-encode that a moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so when when it comes to all of this sort of Oh, update on the um family thing. Now I keep being challenged when I use. So you know, we were talking last week around um Aiden going, well, it's not my brain, but it is my brain. Yes. Uh, now they're doing it to me. Oh, nice. I love it. It makes me laugh because, well, no, it's not my brain, but it is my brain. But okay, it's not really. It's, it's all of it. It's, it's my perceptive system. It's you. It's me. Yeah, it's you. Again, it's that, it's that vulnerability of just accepting actually, mm. you know what? That's just me. It's my mm. experience right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, when, uh, it's in, interesting. Uh, I'm, so being half deaf, obviously, I, I know a little bit of sign language, uh, BSL. But I'm learning. That's why we're doing it today on Sunday, not Saturday, because I'm learning BSL. I, I'm I'm committing myself to learning more BSL. And they said, oh, so what do you do? What, what's your job? And I was like, well, I research. And I had no idea how to communicate ecological psychology in BSL. So I just spelt it. I had to fingerspell ecological psychology. Oh. <laughs> and, and they said, well, there's a couple of signs for psychology. Which I'm like, okay, but normally when you when you're signing in BSL, it's an action. How do you action ecological? And they were saying, well, you action. could do, yeah, well, you could do tree, 
And I'm like, yeah, but it's not environmental psychology, it's ecological. So I'm like, it's an animal and the environment. And they said, I don't know, you're going to have to make it up. So I'm going to have to, in some way, make it up, which right there made me think, wait, so me learning a language, eco like um, a BSL, and having to essentially create my own way of communicating the research that I'm doing, there is an emergence of communication within BSL. There is an emergence of communication because ecological psychology hasn't been communicated through BSL yet, to my knowledge at least. So the language that we're using in sign, similar with verbal, but the verbal communication of this language elsewhere it's, it's going to have to emerge. So when we're talking with other individuals in conferences, the language, I think, needs to emerge in the culture, needs to emerge in the conversation, because you can't just loan the intelligence to the individuals coming into the conference. No, no. Because we don't believe in loaning intelligence or the, the loan of intelligence when it comes to empiricism and gaining knowledge, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't want to do a philosophical deep, deep, deep dive right now. But no, you don't. No. <laughs> Did that on Discord this morning. I literally woke up and went straight into Locke and Aristotle. Oh, good, good morning to you too. <laughs> exactly. I woke up, looked at my phone. I had a ping in Discord, in a Discord server, and they they were asking about um, constructivism. I was like, oh, well, Locke and Aristotle, and then we've got Descartes, blah, blah. So I, I <laughs> sent this message, carried on. And when I read it back, I was like, there's so many errors in there, <laughs> like spelling errors where I'm just typing on my phone in bed. <laughs> But yeah, so that's what I woke up to this morning. And and where where I see the, the potential in conferences coming is combining practice design, mm. actions um, with conversation. Because I don't I don't think you can have a truly ecological conference because ideas need to be communicated. Yeah. But I think there are there are conversations that can be had which are closer to the practice than a lecture. Yes. So I would prefer to have people come on and talk about their philo philosoph philosophy of practice in a conversation on a podcast than meet up at a conference somewhere. Yeah. Which makes me which makes me think, okay, the ecological conferences that are out there, I would argue, are designed through cognitive cognitivistic approaches of learning. Which is somewhat hypocritical. So how do we design an ecologically valid conference? And that is the question that I got stuck on, which is why I put it in to, for us to talk about. <laughs> what does so what would it, what would it look like? What would it what what does it need? What are the pieces? People. Cool. But this to me. The practice itself, if you take sport and you look at the practice, you have the activity itself, the activity, the thing, and then you have a coach guiding whatever the practice is, right? So if a coach is coaching another, this is going to go a bit meta, if a coach is coaching other coaches, yeah, right, then they, the coach is constraining what the coach can do. And that's what I think we're looking to do with the conference, because I imagine yeah. most individuals going to the conference won't be students they are students because everyone's learning but they're going to be individuals that are likely going to be using the ideas to educate they're, yes they would be teachers business owners coaches people that are likely looking to use whatever approach we're talking about to help other people to learn so it would be a, a an educator's education conference yes yes which means we would need, I think, environments or practice of education for there to be feedback, guidance for. Mm. So it's almost like you would need a, well, like a mock is workshop. Is it a conference or is it a workshop? Precisely. Well, I, I, what, sounds, what's the it difference? Sounds, it sounds more like well, the name yeah. and the expectations attached to the name because it would, it would, Although it could be deemed, uh, is there a hybrid where it's both, where it's having the conversation, as we were saying earlier, we were having the conversations and there is that standing up and listening and teaching because that is the constraint of the environment that we're in as a conference. And then there is also the workshopping in between. 
and so it it's kind of a it's kind of all of it it's a it's a little bit of like we do this piece and we also do this piece it, it and it needs to be very much yeah I, I, see, I see it as a coaching session so the inside of the ecological dynamics like the uh, jiu-jitsu and the rest of it their workshop their event as it were was okay here's a coach coaching stuff and other coaches are going to coach things and they're going to get feedback about practice design about different ideas and that's what happens inside of sport you you do a, a talky bit sometimes the talky bit is a bit long but then you go into the workshoppy bit so you sort of have a conference and then a workshop to me that's just a coaching session like mm. that, that is just practice you need a little bit of instructional design like a uh, loan of intelligence to build up the practice you need to impart some sort of constraints for the practice yeah. to continue you can't just say right now go do the thing the, the coach needs to s explain what the constraint is design the game before actually doing playing the game and and that's how i see potential conferences designed ecologically is yeah. you have the the game the game rules the game constraints laid out and then the individuals go and explore the environment, ideally with the individual guiding different views, then coming back and continuing conversations and feedback. We've seen it. That, that's what workshops typically are in sports coaching, at least. I imagine they exist in business. I don't know. Okay, maybe not. Not that I've experienced. They've primarily been very much information... Lectures. Lectures. Right. Yeah, okay. it is very much... It is... It is talking about the thing. Sometimes there are workshops, but still, even then, I think the thing, the closest that's happened that was something that I ran, where it was very much a practical, we're going to do this thing now. And so some of it, so I suppose it's the, you've got the copywriting stuff. So copywriting kind of workshops, where you're writing copy, where you're actually act in act, like actually doing it in that session. So those are really good kind of workshoppy things. Um, they're often done online. Um, and I suppose the same. I, I think from what I've seen in conversation, the events and conferences that are starting to happen more, that obviously in COVID's out down and people are traveling more, is people are f looking for activities like what's a good activity to do here i'm mean, like that that's coaching you're you're constraining practice design like it's not a hey what can i what activity what team building activity can i put into this conference no it's what what's your practice design if you can't design practice i would argue you're not an effective coach like, if if you're asking other people hey what what drills essentially can i put in my conference you're you're doing the 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 controller coach. Oh, I I need I need instruct like I can give the instructions, but I need to find a game to put here to make it. Yeah, fun. you need to find a thing to make it thing so that it yeah. can think. Yeah, it's like I I want a list of exercises that I can give my participants to do. Like no, no. If you're saying here's a list of exercises, you're saying it's going to work for each individual, which doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. Because mm. everyone learns differently. So it's not a, oh, here's an exercise or here's an activity to do. It's a, okay, this is the practice design that we're going to use and the constraints we're going to use to help you find, uh, for lack of a better term, the solution to the problem. But I don't think, from my experience anyway, business coaches are looking at conferences like that. No, they're looking to, I mean... I, whenever I go to a business conference these days, I'm not looking to learn very, like, as in, in the traditional, I'm not looking to be educated. There we go, that's better. I'm not looking to be educated. I'm looking to be in a room with other business owners and hear about how they do things and what they do and why they do. Like, that's the bit that I find that it, it's the bit after the talky talkies where I hear people talking about uh, uh, at a lot of the a lot of the talks that I experienced recently, there was it was a lot of like uh, talking about, and there was I was like, okay, cool, but what? But what? What can I do? What actions can I take? How? What? What am I supposed to? Do? You give your you give. How do I solve the problem? 
Like, how do I solve the problem that I have? And and that it was a really interesting because the one person I didn't think who would do that for me actually was like, oh, cool, this is really, I can actually action and do something with this. It's not just, uh, here is how I work and you will listen. It was very much a, here's an actionable approach that you can take, here's, here's, here's a tool. It was based on, on, on using an app, unfortunately, but also it was beyond the app. It was talking about why and how and where and when. I was like, oh, cool, okay, cool, that's interesting. Here, and although it still isn't specific enough, which I don't think it could be in that room because there were 600 other people and I don't think that would be even possible for 600 even with 600 other people in that current well, is it possible how would it be possible and I was going to say that, that that's the better question how could it be possible because there's self-organization if so yeah. self-organization you can have millions of creatures self-organized together yeah so 600 people should be able to self-organize it just depends on the constraints of the environment that you've put in there because they all they all got to the room <laughs> and, and that they were all sat in the same tables so everyone was sat in the tables with people that they knew mm. well, and that that to me is a more interesting question when it comes to conferences how do you create practice design in a conference environment workshop environment that can help guide individuals solve problems together because i don't as much as people think they go to conferences to get the answers. I don't think that's what they go for. Because most most people that I've spoken to after a conference, they enjoy the conversations with people after the talks and yeah. the, the in-between bits. That's more enriching for them because they're hearing how other people are solving problems. Yeah, because that's the bit I find interesting. That's so why don't we just emphasize that bit? I don't know. Th that, that would be what I would want to do. So... Yes, breakout rooms are useful, but breakout rooms would be, okay, now you've been given a game, a practice design, you've been given constraints, you have a task to complete, go complete it. Obviously, in physical movements, that could be, okay, you have two mats, there's five of you here, you can't touch the floor there, get to the line over there. So five of you stand on the mat, then one moves it around, you try and problem solve. And you work together to figure it out. And it, and the process of problem solving, you can see how other people in your group work together. Breakout rooms in conferences is the same principle or on tables. I'm just thinking about from a business perspective, I'd be so interested to see a bunch of coaches attend this because the result would be, oh, you just do this. <laughs> oh, we need to do this. But you have all five of them saying, we need to do this. And you're like, well, no, you've got to work together. <laughs> yeah, it would be really interesting to 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 see that they're, they're um, called team building exercises but they're not team building exercises they're, no. they're problem solving it's practice designed for problem solving it's almost like creating a problem and then putting it in front of them and seeing that that's what coaching is that, yeah that is what coaching is the coach lays out the task and says right this is what you're going to try and do in football try and score the goal in basketball try and get the ball in the hoop yeah. in football if you say right get the ball in the goal and no one's standing in the way just pass it along the floor great now someone stands in the middle okay you're gonna have to curl it around them now you've got two people okay well i'm gonna have to move slightly to the left and now kick it well what if they move well now i'm gonna have to get past them i'm gonna have to kick it over them and you change the task task constraints to elicit different solutions and those solutions are going to change in business it's exactly the same thing you could quite literally set up a business problem and give it to four people and say right you need to solve this now with your expertise now all four oh, of them... i want to do that so bad <laughs> if, if you were to say okay you you have five potential clients how are you, how are you going to plan this in I know, two hours you have to speak with five clients in two hours. How are you going to plan it? All four coaches would come at it drastically differently. And what I think experiencing how each coach solves that problem is more beneficial as a conversation starter or as a practice design than someone at the front lecturing going, well, you could do this and you could do this and you could do this. Because mm. after that five, 10 minute conversation of you four coaches exploring the problems. That's a mastermind in business. They label it as a mastermind. It's just practice design. That's just coaching. Which is why they're so bloody expensive. <laughs> they coaching. make it so expensive and inaccessible to anyone who is 
No. Doesn't have money. Huh? That doesn't have money. <laughs> Basically, yeah. People who are... This is something that I've been thinking about. So, and I've been having a conversation with another, uh, with a business friend around this of like, I recognize, I think you prompted me on this uh, two sessions, two couple of weeks ago in one of our previous podcasts. Like, who do I want to help? Because I could help people get the 1% of the 1%, because it would be 1% of the 1%. And I could do that. But but the bit that I'm interested in is the 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 ones that make the the biggest impact like for them mm. and it takes them from the you know the 50 percent to the 80 percent you know it's sort of using arbitrary numbers because arbitrary is meh yeah, but time scales like, and take, fractals and all that yeah it taking the, like because the biggest difference like for me as a coach that i can make is for people who are not who don't feel that they're there Whereas people at the top of their game, you know, the six, seven figure business owners, sure, I could help them too. Absolutely. Like some of this stuff will take, get, squeeze that little, little tiny bit more out of it. And I think that's where most of the, if we call it productivity, it's not productivity because it's practical design. Where most of the productivity experts are, it's that 1% of the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Whereas I'm more interested in, in, in the practice design element of the being able to create and to to it's more Wait, exciting the to, to add some labels because you know we love labels inside coaching you can either be a performance coach or a participation mm. coach and mm. performance coaches are high performance coaches they they work on the getting you saying bolts it increases 100 meter speed by like 0.1 of a second but then the participation coach instead of working with one elite athlete for a week they work with 300 participation people to just get them active get them doing stuff that for me is where my interest is i want to be a high performance coach in participation individuals yes Yes, that is exactly, I was just like, I want to bring the high performance things that we, that high performance coaches use into bi in, into the business world of people who are participating, who, who are just, who are just in business because they want to be in business, not because they want to earn a million pounds, not because they want, but because they want to be excited about all of the little things that they do because they have so many ideas they have so much inspiration they have so much excitement for lots of lots of things specifically for my my people it's like lots of things that they want to do and that's overwhelming that that to me is like in sport you've got the people doing the physical activity like they're, they're not down the bottom of the ladder they're they're physically active but how do, how do you how do you keep them active how do you keep them engaged because once once you've done the same drills over and over by a coach it gets boring and then you just stop and it's similar inside of business because i mean this is just experiences after all we're just yeah. adding labels for context here but inside of business if you've done the same thing over and over and over again and either you're not getting the same results for whatever reason or you're getting bored of doing the same thing a a coach someone to help you through that like that that that's what a coach is for. They're helping you to guide to continually either maintain, sustain, improve, whatever it is that you're doing, the activity that you're doing, whether it be business, sport, life, etc. And that for me, the coaches for me there should <laughs> be doing the exact same thing as the high performance coaches. I, th I think the only difference between the individual, like the 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 only difference would be the individual and where their performance is at. Mm. To, to gain a improvement on something you're already very, very good at takes far longer because you're well-trained. Yeah. And it's more interesting to work. I like seeing results and seeing them fast. Like just, just to see a client go from being constantly overwhelmed, feeling like they don't know what they're doing to being able to launch a retreat <laughs> in two weeks. <laughs> like after 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 working with them for like a, a number of months, all of a sudden, just within two weeks, launching and marketing and uh, the, all of a sudden, just done. That's the bit I find fun. That's mm. the bit I find interesting. Critical state. Yeah, yeah. That that's the critical state for me. Yeah. the The issue with that, or uh, some people would see it as an issue, is it's it's not of high ticket. I don't right. give a shit. Well, no, I know, but th that's, that's uh, but what... yeah, that is exactly the conversation we've that, been that's having. That's the issue. Yeah, well, 
Well, well, yeah, but you're, you, you know, you could help more people and bigger people and, and charge so much more and, and, and charge your worth. And if I was to charge my worth, no one could bloody afford me. And that's kind of the point for most people who are in our position. They couldn't mm. afford the changes we could create because... And that is why I think the ecological approach to a conference, whether it is a uh, mastermind webinar, wh whatever you want to call it, I think if you were to design like that, more people would benefit because it's more effective learning experiences, but it takes more effort. It takes more time because the ecological approach, taking an ecological approach is effortful <laughs> because yeah. it's effective. Yeah. So th it that's... requires work. It requires you to oof requires you to oof yes you're welcome that's the high quality content you expect here from us so i guess the the closing question would be for a, either for anyone listening that's interested and sounds like oh that sounds like a good idea or for john yourself because obviously you're here is i would like to speak with more individuals about their like philosophy of practice on here as conversation yeah, yeah. it'd be really good i, I want to get people on here to talk about their whole why they do the way things they do and oh, it'd be so interesting and I, I want to emphasize i don't want it to be i know what i do so i'm going to tell you it's a i yeah. have no idea what i'm doing let's explore this yeah like that that's that's the sort of stuff that I'm I'm quite happy to hear but also when it comes to a conference of introducing people to taking an ecological approach I think online would be the easiest view, easiest way to do it, um, and potentially yes. running sessions like that. But I'm I'm not sure. I I, I have an idea that I'm not going to say just in case it comes back to bite me in the bum on recording. <laughs> so I'll 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 share yeah. you in a I'll share it with you. Uh, I I was think because one of the questions I was thinking about um, on one of the things I was reflecting on is so the ecological approach and and the the approach that I follow is very much constrained by the number of people i feel and so in like it w the best results come from working one to one with someone because then you can get very specific but obviously there are only 70 hours <laughs> so either i'm doing 50 60 70 like lots and lots of hours which unfortunately i can't that is a constraint i have or what what would it look scaled up i hate how, that how phrase. would you help how would you help more than a couple of people yeah how would you help more than a couple of people because obviously what we do is quite um dive quite deep and so how would you help more people and this sounds like a potential possibility because it's people helping people and it's going through the approach of like here is a problem. How would you solve it? Let's discuss it. Let's go through. Like, is the mastermind element of it where there is a little bit of almost you know, teaching, I suppose, to set the constraint and then moving. And it, it's basically like a group program. Basically, if you want to put a label on it, it's a group program where you take a small number of people through an experience. And in fact, one of my business buddies is actually doing that with the marketing, with the marketing right now. I'm like, oh, ha, ha. yeah, that's that's a nice way. And you don't have to charge Tiago Forte numbers to do a cohort-based course. You know, I mean, it requires effort and work. And I, th I, sure. I don't, I don't like the cohort-based course label because no. a lot of the time it's still like for for an ecological perspective, at least from an ecological perspective, at least because a lot of the time it's still a person giving you information. Like it's it's the teacher tells the student what to do. It's the transfer of knowledge it's less practice design mm. like, there's not actual doing the thing and i feel like a lot of people are scared as well to do the thing because they're worried about yeah, so mistakes. they want to think about the... doing the thing they want to th they want to think about doing the thing they want to have conversations about the thing whilst not doing the thing because doing the thing is scary because what if you get it wrong exactly and i feel i feel like the conferences the the courses the cohort based courses and other courses if you have something that you can template, if you can template your course, then it is instruction design. It's not practice design because you're just telling people what to do or telling people your experience. They aren't doing the practice. If you're there constraining practice, then you're coaching. Yeah. And the assumption is you use the videos to constrain practice, but 
Yeah, that that is a set it and forget it, which isn't what the constraints led approach is. You don't set it and forget it because everyone will react, behave differently, especially when you have multiple affordances or potential multiple solutions to a problem. If you see something as the coach that isn't effective, but it's effective for the uh, task constraints that the individual has at that moment, the coach then needs to intervene in some way and either add a constraint, remove a constraint, or do something to dissuade the ineffective solution if the coach believes it's ineffective. Otherwise, it might just be a unique solution to a problem that you haven't thought about. And if it is, then you telling people what to do is the limiter. It yeah. is the parameter that's getting in the way, which is what I think a lot of um, cohort of eight courses do, which is why yeah. I don't take many of them. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. But that is... That's effective, but it's a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of commitment. And they are, what I would argue, communities, more communities than conferences. Yes. So, but yeah, I think we'll leave that one there because obviously we've got another one to do today. I don't know what the, sh the shimmy was. I don't know, just excited. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. All right. See you next week. Bye. Bye.